Thank you. My first question actually to the panel is, can you guys give us a sense of the opportunity in mobility? Uh, how big is the market, uh, whether it's regionally or globally? And eventually, how is this uh, affecting all of these industries? Jawad, do you, you want to give us a sense of the, the size? Thank you. Uh, unlike fixed telephony, uh, where the telephone service and connectivity uh, served locations, the addressable market for mobile is much, much higher. And that's why across the region, across the world, and of course in the Arab world, we have a lot more cellular users than there are fixed lines. We have a lot more mobile broadband users accounts than there are uh, ADSL or fiber to the home broadband accounts. So that's the addressable market. In the region, cellular services are booming. Over the past uh, three years, the cellular lines in the Arab world are increasing, according to Arab advisors' uh, research, are increasing by 50 to 60 million uh, cellular lines uh, every year. Uh, that's the major trend happening, a lot more uh, lines than fixed telephony. And of course, the major change that happened with, uh, with more intelligence on the handset and the, the smart uh, phones and the smart uh, tablets, the smart handhelds in general, is the fact that the relationship is no longer between the telecom operator and uh, uh, the, the end user, but rather between uh, multiple people and the end user. So when Apple or, uh, or Google introduced the Android, uh, let's say, for example, uh, the Apple example, in many cases, especially when, when uh, people are heavily using the applications and the intelligence functionality in the handset, the, uh, the providers of that intelligence, the providers of those applications, the providers of the platform are actually might know a lot more about the consumer, might have a stronger, closer relation with the consumer than the telecom operator who uh, sends the bill uh, every month. So that's uh, a major dynamic happening, and that presents a major opportunity uh, for uh, small companies because over the past 20 years, ICT's main uh, contribution was the compression of time and space, and now with these platforms and with these uh, intelligence uh, in the hands of people with the fact that many people in the world, especially in the third world, their first interaction with the internet will be through a mobile device, presents major opportunities, and further compresses time and space. So again, it's the, the land of opportunity is no longer the US. You don't have to sail to the US on a boat to be in the land of opportunity. It really is wherever you have a strong, nice internet connection, that can be your land of opportunity. Thanks. Anyone else want to give us a sense? Sebastian, maybe you give us a go. Just one comment. I think what we've seen in the, in the Middle East and the is that penetration is all, almost reaching 100%. But that's 100% on, on the phone. But the smartphone penetration is still quite low, around 10%. And it's also data revenue is still, on a, if you compare it to the global, quite low in the Middle East, which means that there's lots of potential. Because it's when people start having smartphones that they can really use sort of the potential of the mobile. Um, the mobile broadband and sort of the mobile applications like e-health, uh, smart transportation systems and so forth. So there is an extreme potential in this region to, to really leverage on the mobile broadband and, and the possibilities that it enables. We see also with the, with the lifetime, uh, you know, people are changing devices uh, faster and faster. Uh, we see a, a huge acceleration of uh, smart devices uh, on the uh, what we are seeing on the, the smartphone uh, market is that they, there is definitely a trend toward low-end devices. Many very large markets are looking at uh, getting smartphone with open operating system at 50 US dollar. Uh, so this is something that is really helping to, uh, to go much faster you know, into mass market. Uh, we see more and more uh, Chinese manufacturers bringing Android across the board. Uh, and the number overall of activation of smart devices is accelerating tremendously on the Something back to, to mobile penetration. Uh, today, you look at some markets. You know there is, uh, like in Saudi Arabia, uh, almost 190% uh, uh, mobile penetration because every people have multiple SIM cards and they are really switching from one operator to the other. So uh, the mobile connectivity is becoming really a, a commodity uh, and is really used more and more across multiple devices. I mean the the explosion explosion of broadband devices. You know uh, of. Uh, Really, uh, USB keys, you know, has been also quite uh, uh, tremendous, and we see more and more with the deployment of LTE networks that it's going and it's accelerating further. In general, you know, we like to say that mobile is the largest platform ever created. If you look at it today, 
there are more uh, mobile phones in the hands of people. It's around 5 billion mobile subscribers around the world today. This is more than the total number of people who have access to drinking water, more than the total number of people who have uh, toothbrushes. But more interestingly, you know, for us here, more than the total number of screens. If you count all screens available in the world, so TV screens, PC screens, laptop screens, they don't amount to more than 2 to 2.5 billion. Whereas you have 5 billion screens, small ones, but really personal screens, in the pocket of every person around the world. Now, out of these 5 billion, we're looking at around 1.3 to 1.5 today that have access to mobile internet via 3G and 4G network. And as Sebastian was saying, what we're really trying to break now is the, the, the barrier to entry to have a smartphone in your pocket, so that we get to what uh, Jawad said, is uh, how do we make sure, and it is a fact in most of our region anyway, that the first experience that anybody has towards the net is coming nowadays from a mobile device, not really from a fixed device. So, does, what's the internet penetration? We know, do what? Yeah, well, that's a very contentious issue. It's. Uh, I mean, I, I want to, and my question to you is then, how does the internet penetration and mobile penetration compare? And uh, should we all just drop working for the internet and just work on mobile? <laughs> well, it's, okay, then let's take a step back. It's very easy to measure account penetration, fixed account penetration. But internet users penetration is a bit more tricky because with an ADSL line or a fiber to the home connection, multiple people will use that uh, connection. And what we see in the region is that unfortunately some Arab governments try to uh, give a better uh, uh, function of the internet users. So they look at the internet accounts and then they realize that if we multiply that internet account by an account user, uh, account user multiplier to calculate or estimate the users, if it's multiplied by the logical three to five, depending on the country, then our internet users' penetration vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world will be very low. So actually, we've seen some governments in the region, I will keep them nameless, some of them have been toppled, so that's the hint. Uh, uh, we've seen some governments actually apply a multiplier of 10 or 11 or 12, so as to inflate the number of internet users reported in the country. We disagree with that. We think that the internet user's penetration in the Arab world, the multiplier should be between three to five, depending on the country. And for a mobile broadband connection, the multiplier is no more than 1.25, and that's what we use. And based on that, we've seen some Arab countries where internet user's penetration is uh, ahead of the, uh, over 40%, 30%, but many other countries still have internet user's penetration of less than uh, 5%. And this is where I agree again with Ziad that the, the, the road to enhancing internet connectivity and internet penetration in the Arab world might very well be through uh, smartphones and through the cellular handsets because that's where most of the people are already connected. And if we move them to the smartphone platforms, if we move them to use mobile broadband, that will, that's how you get an exponential increase in internet users in the region. I think we are really entering an era where uh, uh, web and mobile are converging. Uh, and I would say that, you know, all the uh, all the industry from uh, all the, the web industry, you know, is uh, is really now entering uh, full stream into mobile, and we see that you know with the the evolution toward the HTML5, toward being able to publish on uh, multi screens, you know, uh, in a, in a seamless uh, manner. Uh, I mean, web is really uh, you know is really going into uh, into mobile. I mean, when you look at you know that the fact that there are more than uh, 450 million active users on Facebook on mobile, you know, it's an amazing, very powerful uh, personal media. Uh, and what we, we see also is that more and more, uh, I mean, uh, internet players are, are really looking at mobile seriously. I mean, uh, they, they, they was uh, at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Firefox was announcing some uh, concept devices where all the uh, intelligence of the smart device is into the browser. Uh, and you see that, you know, more and more, I mean, yeah, I mean, applications are evolving toward also this uh, web-based type of uh, encapsulated experience. So. so. I guess then the yeah, you want to yes, yeah, I was busy following the Twitter shit. Uh, the, 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 it's a mix, you know, of uh, and although of what uh, Jawad and uh, Sebastian said, and although our position when I started it is that mobile is the biggest platform. When you think about it, there are two convergences that are happening. Uh, first of all, it's the convergence of uh, consumer electronics with mobile, where, where we see more and more consumer electronic functionality built in into these devices, maybe not this one particularly, but uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, phone cameras taking over digital cameras, phone uh, video recorders taking over traditional video recorders, navigation through your uh, phone with Nokia Drive, for instance, etc. So that is one thing that is happening. At the same time, what is converging 
And this is where we cannot totally drop the fixed internet, but find a way to seamlessly integrate with it, is mobile into our fixed environment. So if you look at it, mobile today is starting to integrate with my living room. I expect to be able to share my photos uh, or my movies with my, with my TV or with other people in my house. How will that translate into the work environment? Because at the end of the day, we are into an industry day. So how does this reflect into different industry? How does my phone uh, help me do my work better and interact with the rest of my office, uh, with my hospital, with my travel agency, et cetera, et cetera? So, uh, this is a great segue into, into my next question, right? So, and, and this one is actually particularly for, for Lisa. Um, we talk, uh, Ericsson has a vision of a network society, right? <clears throat> Which is about connected devices, not connected people. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Society. It's about really, we're moving, you know, the first way we connected was homes being connected. So you would call someone, you say, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so, is that person home? And then we started connecting people. So now the first thing they usually ask is, where are you? And they will say, whatever you are. And then now we're moving into that, and that can only reach you know, the, popula the population size, which is five, six billion people. But now we're moving into actually connecting people. So that means that your cars can be connected. That means that your dishwasher can be connected. And when all of these things that can benefit from, um, from a connection starts interrelating and connect to each other, then we really see sort of the benefits of the network society. And so, for example, it could be your dishwasher being connected so that you turn on your dishwasher when the electricity, the price of electricity is lower because the consumption is lower during the day. Because usually there's peak periods in the morning and there's peak periods in the, in the evening. But if you can turn your dishwasher on at 2 p.m., then your electricity bill might go down. So it's also connecting things, but also generating benefits, both for the society and for the people of the society. So just a, a, a misnomer, right? You, were, you mean about connecting devices? Yes. Yes, right. So, uh, and we're talking really about smart devices here, right? Smart refrigerators, smart microwaves, smart dishwashers. Uh, I, I, I heard a, an example of this at one point where, you know, you know we might have smart toilets that, that, you know, tell the other devices in our house that we're not there because no one has used them. So uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's an interesting concept to see where the, this connectivity is taking us. Yes. Yeah, that we will try to spice it up, and then a tweet uh, provoked me. He said the panelists are uh, stating the obvious and preaching to the converted, and the people uh, in the room have more insights than, uh, than the panelists. I would agree with that. You probably have a lot more insights than with us, so, but let's shake it up a bit. So I'll throw in something. First, the smartphone adoption in the region. We've done surveys at Arab Advisors in five countries, and actually the, the smartphone adoption, people who have smartphones that either use uh, iOS or Android or Windows or Symbian, uh, actually over 40% in most of the countries, over 50% in Saudi Arabia. That's the good part. The, the, the less uh, uh, reassuring part is that in many instances, almost 55 or so percent of these people with a smartphone actually use the application functionality of the smartphone. So we have a situation where many people own the smartphone, own the iPhone because of its nice and status symbol approach, but actually only use it for SMS and phones. So that's, that's one thing I'd like to throw to the audience of how, to, how we can change that. And another thing, it's the debate ongoing whether laptops and PCs will remain with us as a complement to the, the smart handhelds, or will it all be cloud-based future where every, all your information is on the cloud and you just have those smart windows into the cloud and it takes you, and whether you use your TV or whether you use your uh, your uh, smart handheld or, or tablet or very thin uh, client, uh, that's the future. So maybe we'll, uh, I just, it provoked me the tweet, that's why. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they are used for SMS. But what we did that, we have a consumer lab that does a lot of research. And when we look at it on the global level, 75% of the time that you spend on your phone it's not actually voice calls or SMS, but anything else like tweeting, Facebook, logging into your email account and so forth. So that means that there's quite a lot of potential here to, to really uh, expand the, uh, the use of the services. Okay. I just want to do one remark as to the, the multiplication of connected devices. I think what, what we see, especially you know, with the new generation, uh, with the, the digital natives, is, uh, is how media consumption is done. You know, so, uh, we are now an era of upper media consumptions. Uh, I mean, we see that you know all these uh, young people are really 
multitasking, they have a very short at attention span, you know, they are really packing uh, uh, seven hours of media consumption into four, and I think this is also one of the, I think one of the biggest challenges is how to catch user attention uh, and how to really, uh, yeah, get, you know, the, the, the time, you know, that, that they can spend on your apps, because uh, if you look at the, the industry, we've been looking at, of course, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's magic to see that Angry Birds space, you know, uh, is bringing uh, uh, 10 million downloads in three days, you know, and, and that really IPs are created, you know, from, the, from the, the, the mobile industry. But at the end, what is really important is to look at not only the, what the downloads you do, but how you monetize, you know, how you really build on, uh, at the end, you know, get, uh, get a life out of, uh, of uh, developing applications. So for me, it's really, uh, um, I, I, it's also about, you know, uh, I think the beauty of this, uh, you know, this explosion of, uh, of uh, mobile media consumption is also it's the era of analytics. I think the beauty is that for every industry, what web and mobile bring is that you can measure every single thing. You can put, you know, on every single apps, ways of tracking user behavior, way of, of interacting with users. And I think, you know, the, the company that will succeed are really the ones that are able to extract this analytics and br bring it back into their, their products and their solutions. So, <coughs> I, I, I'm going to actually uh, open the, up to the floor after one question. Uh, and since this is about industry, right? Uh, I wanted to, the, the idea of this panel really was for all of us to get a sense before we go off into different tracks to understand the uh, similarity in what's happening in the use of mobile technology across different industries, right? So whether mobile is being used in healthcare or it's being used in education, there's a lot of similarities. And uh, I wanted to see if you guys have some examples that you, you're interested in sharing with the audience about, especially if you have some examples of what's happening here in the region. Uh, whether it's operator side or it's startups or, or companies that are doing uh, mobile apps and things that are related to industries. Uh, and then uh, audience, get your questions ready. If you think you can ask better questions, I challenge you. <laughs> I can start. Uh, as part of the Network Society, we, we make a report which is called Network Society Index, which is really rating cities and mega cities, because mega cities face similar kind of problems. And so it's rate, rating them in terms of how do they really leverage on the ICT and the ICT investment? And in this region, uh, there's three uh, um, cities included, Cairo, Istanbul, and Karachi. And for example, in Cairo, they've been, they've um, what they call an e-health program, where they do a remote monitoring uh, system where, where they can transfer all the patients' journals electronically, which of course saves a lot of time and efficiency in, in, the, in the hospitals. <coughs> But it can also be that if you go to a new hospital, you don't have your files with you, that hospital can just transfer your files to whatever hospital you end up going to. So in that way, you can always be sure that whatever physician you're meeting has sort of your medical history. Another thing that they have, they have remote mammography. So they will go remotely to, to the women that might not have access or might not be able to transport themselves to the hospital. They will go to their homes and do the mammography. And of course, that saves it's nice for the person because you, maybe you feel more comfortable being home, but it's also good for, from a social aspect because you make sure that you reach out to a greater audience. So from the perspective of answering some of uh, also Jawad's uh, concern, and it's a challenge to everybody. So here I'm going to post, uh, post a few questions to the audience maybe. This yeah. will help them also ask us questions later on. First of all, 50% of the people are actually using the apps of the smartphones. And this for us as Qualcomm today is a big problem. And the reason why we are here is that we're, you know, we're powering some of the leading smartphones in the world, 3G technologies and all of that. <laughs> These are expensive devices. Like you said, they're merging into consumer electronics. We have very high definition screens, capabilities to play video, music, uh, all that you want. And if people end up using them only for text and mobile phone calls, then you know people eventually will stop buying them. So let's let's state the obvious here that we, we're trying to increase the sales of mobile phones now. What we're doing here in the region and why we are here today is to engage with the local innovation and talent and uh, apps developers and content creators to get more content and more applications that are relevant for the regions coming from the region. Something that you maybe started yesterday, something that Sebastian can talk a lot more about uh, later on. Second challenge we have, and this is, uh, you know, Toby continued from last year's ArabNet, and my question to Fauzi somewhere in the back is, that you asked how many people ever clicked a web banner ad. The real question is how many people ever clicked a mobile banner ad. That, you know, 
Fauzi, you need to answer that one. And it is not for watching it, yeah? And the third question, and this is an existentialist question about the state of the industry and the big challenge for all of us. The way things are going, uh, Jawad said it, you know, new companies are coming in, they hold the end-to-end -end stream of information related to me as a consumer, and they are getting most of the revenue. Uh, the operators have a challenge, and uh, they, they are in this dilemma between are we a pipe, a smart pipe, a dump pipe, a big fat pipe, whatever we are. Now, if this continues the way it is continuing, operators will lose a lot of revenue. If operators stop making money, nobody will invest in building networks, high-speed networks, good networks, the technology will start falling <coughs> apart. Governments might take over the technology, we'll see national you know, broadband networks, national LTE networks maybe. But at the end of the day, you know, moving from the operator to the government is not really the best move. You know, heck, the government provides us with water to the home, but they can't even provide us with a bottle of water, correct? These are private companies that do that. So what is really going to change in the industry, in this region, to get some profitability back to the operators so that they can sustain this investment and really provide this infrastructure to everybody else to use and strive upon? And maybe this is about, right, creating products with industries, right, about uh, the operators. Maybe they don't get into the uh, traditional content game. I saw some tweets here that are like, you know, maybe we should have Apple and Google on stage, not Qualcomm and Ericsson. And, and my answer to that is, you know, maybe Google and, and, uh, and Apple are not really working with enterprise. And maybe this is what, we, what we're talking about today, right? The question of what can telecom operators do working with hospitals to create new kinds of devices, to create new kinds of applications that uh, maybe are not necessarily even B2C, maybe they're B2B. Uh, but that are improving quality of care or quality of service and also improving profitability and uh, you know uh, improving maybe general health uh, general education uh, that's kind of the importance and that's where kind of these global companies are also working uh, to push the, the boundaries one of the, la the largest opportunity I see for, uh, for mobile operators in the region on, uh, in where, where we are really uh, with much more devices than uh, credit cards, you know, is, uh, is mobile payment. I mean, we see that today, you know, what uh, mobile operators will o always have is this billing relationship with an end user on, on this really ways of, yeah, of being able to bill him in a, in a secure, trusted uh, manner. Uh, and this is really, uh, I mean, we see a, a big shift, you know, toward not only digital goods, but really toward physical goods. And I think this is... Uh, uh, what, what is happening with, uh, I mean, we see this with NFC, we see this with Visa certified devices. There is definitely a big shift, you know, that will happen on, it's a, a very large opportunity. Same also with, uh, yeah, with, when you look at the region where in many countries there are many expat people, mobile money and international money transfer via mobile phones is, uh, is very, very big. Uh, and we see also even, uh, you know, some, uh, some solution where not only you can transfer money, the problem of transferring money, you never know what people will do with the money you send them. So uh, there are also solutions where you can even transfer airtime. So you are sure that, you know, uh, uh, for example, someone in India will use, you know, what you send him in the, in the, in the best way because they will use it for, for mobile consumption. So we were talking about mobile uh, broadband. Well, what I, electricity due to candles, mobile due to technology. So we are okay to that, right? So, uh, mobile and social network ain't so angel, at least not for users, said the FBI. I'm talking about uh, uh, mobile broadband is good, but companies want more to know about the customer, more about his activities and his interests, but not so legally, because two days ago, um, Apple, has, uh, Apple has started rejecting apps that uh, access to U D I D S, I mean the privacy concerns, which is what was is uh, U D I D S. It's uh, it's a kind of uh, software in the application in the company's application, as Starbucks application, for example, for doing statistics. So, what is this user doing with this with his phone? What is what are his interests? So Apple said, no, we're not letting those companies go so far. Uh, uh, pirating the the user itself, so somehow this mobile broadband ain't so angel. So your your concern is about privacy and data. Yeah. So uh, want to address some questions and concerns about privacy? Yeah, I see that uh, privacy, you know, is really one of the biggest challenges because in any social interaction or any uh, you know online interaction, you leave a bit of your privacy. 
uh, and you even see you know businesses that are built to really clean you know the web presence of someone you know in order to yeah to re to rebuild an image you know so uh, it is clear that uh, and we, we see I mean with the explosion of, of smartphones you know it's also one of the big trends is toward mobile security is toward really making sure that you know uh, any application that is downloaded is trusted you know is secure I don't get any uh, Trojan horse inside and as I said you know uh, when you look at a company like Flurry I mean they are tracking you know on, the, on a permanent basis across 140,000 apps, you know, uh, multiple apps that are downloaded millions of times, all user behaviors. And this, of course, has a, has a very big value for any companies, any third parties. And I think we need to put, you know, um, as the mobile society, some rules, you know, to protect end users. Yes, that's exactly what I said. So maybe it is an angel for companies, but not for the user itself. Thank you. So uh, I actually have a... a, a, a comment on this, which is uh, actually by Jeremy Foster, who also works at Ericsson, and a, a friend of mine, and he says, uh, users are in the modern world, many users are happy to trade a bit of uh, privacy for convenience, right? We want to share our location with our friends, so we trade off our privacy, knowing that we can share this content with our friends. Uh, you know, when a lot of people come to me, they're like, what are you doing, Twitter, it's all public. That's the point, right? And this is a decision that we are all making every day. Some people choose to not have a profile on Facebook at all. But most people decide that this is something that they're willing to sacrifice in order to have the benefits of staying in touch with friends, being connected to the brands that they love, etc. So, I'll take the next question. Good morning. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, wonder because uh, the speakers mentioned something about potential markets where uh, we still have an unattained growth in the Middle East market of uh, technology and mobile users. Uh, uh, just a question about are you able to uh, discover, for example, the users, are they familiar uh, with uh, online or uh, mobile technologies that are uh, still, uh, they are kind of, you can say, not educated well enough to be more familiar with uh, using them. Uh, especially, let's say, uh, throughout the Middle East, uh, you can tell not all the, like, the segments, there are so many uh, virgin segments for mobile apps, and they need education. They are uh, more or less uh, unfamiliar how to use it, and especially they are the purchase power units. And we're talking about that, I don't know, the ages, they, they might vary between uh, locations, between areas, between countries. Uh, I, we, can, we can feel like some of the studies that made, we have a lot of virgin market that's still attained. Do you think uh, people still need um, kind of education or about how they can benefit from uh, mobile technology? Uh, so your question really is about is if we're saying that people are not using mobile smart or smartphones in the region about awareness it's yeah. about marketing you guys have a sense of any statistics right we've been we've had a number of people say people are even though they have smart devices they're not using applications do we know why why the, why they why they don't believe in it on these operators, but uh, uh, an ecosystem, I haven't seen, it, it hasn't yet crystallized, an ecosystem where uh, a multitude of companies leveraging that huge base uh, have emerged. We've seen some successes in the value-added service operators, but these are under pressure because of the smartphones, because uh, people are no longer willing to, to pay for the breaking news over their SMS, because now they know they can get it uh, online. It's, I think, the, the, the lower uh, adoption and lower usage of application among smartphone owners in the Arab world uh, might be related to uh, less uh, uh, relevant applications in the region. So, for example, uh, when we did the, the survey in Saudi Arabia, a majority of the Arabic-speaking people actually preferred Arabic language uh, for their applications. And I think if you look at the, the supply of relevant uh, Arabic-based apps in the region versus uh, what, what Apple has on its app store, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a shortfall, and that could explain why a lot less people are using the app's uh, functionality on their smartphones. That's my guess. It's, uh, I, I won't claim it's a hard fact. I, 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 I tend to agree. I mean, the mobile industry 
have a, a major, uh, very nice uh, case study, which is MMS. And the no amount of education that the whole mobile industry tried to do convinced anybody to send an MMS to another person. I mean, it's just not a convenient service. But however, on the other hand, there's a clutter of misinformation that is outside and, and very complicated uh, uh, ways to access uh, mobile internet from complicated data plans to not very friendly tariffs, no roaming, etc., which probably also add to the reason why there is uh, less uh, people on the mobile internet. But I really agree with uh, Jawad. It's about having relevant local, regional uh, that uh, applications that really mean something and bring value to the end user. Yeah. As, we, as we said uh, y yesterday, I mean, yeah. today, if you look at the number of Arabic apps, uh, you know, there are, I would say, a bit more than 1,000. Uh, this is not enough, you know, and I think uh, people need to realize the amazing monetization opportunity application store represents, you know, but because anybody, else, anybody from his home can really develop an app and already make money out of it, you know, and I, I think. Uh, the beauty of the mobile, you know, is, 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 a, is a premium channel. It's a channel where people are used to pay, you know, for, for added value, for convenience. And I, I think this is, you know, something that can get in anybody's home an opportunity to make money. And uh, that's why we want to, I mean, from STC perspective, we want to free, you know, all this innovation, all this creativity, because we see it, you know, on, on the internet. Let's really see it into the, the apps. I, I have a quick question, straw poll for the audience. How many entrepreneurs are there in the room? Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you are building enterprise-related products for healthcare, education, banking, finance, and tourism? Okay, cool. So we've got, we've got a bunch of people who are already building applications uh, or services that are really targeting industries. And that's, I, I think this is really important, and this is, this is part of what you're talking about as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I also develop mobile applications for many platforms, and I'm an Apple user. Uh, I think one of the problems in the Middle East is basically um, that some companies or some platforms actually do not support Arabic content, neither built their programs from the beginning to support Arabic. As in, for example, Windows Phone, none of the carriers in the Middle East is bothering to carry a Windows Phone because it doesn't support Arabic. And believe it or not, even if English or Arab users are using the mobiles or the devices, we actually have a problem of us liking to use the English, even if our English is not good enough to understand the applications. We have a problem of using the applications in Arabic. So I think, I don't, I don't know the number, but a huge percentage of Arabic users are actually using the applications in English while they can't understand it. So the problem here is some platforms or companies not respecting Arabic language enough to build from the beginning that they're, so they make their, uh, their, their applications or their platforms Arabic enabled, like the problem happening with Windows Phone, ending up Nokia sending us low end devices. Thank you. Uh, it is clear that uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that uh, you know, uh, force operators not to really to the fully support, you know, uh, on fully, because uh, that's not the volume where the volume is, but clearly, you know, uh, next year I think it will be a very different story. So. Um, I have a question, if I may. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Samer Ramadan um, from the Pious Walk uh, Foundation. Um, what I would like to ask a question and, and really is of concern is that with all this mobile technology and internet access going into every, everyone's home, uh, what are we doing globally um, in terms of moral responsibility? Um, when we have, uh, I mean, I, I was raised with my mother not allowing me to befriend anybody unless she knew who the father, the mother, and that person was well raised. And uh, she took a good care to raise me as a child. And now, um, we see, you know, never allowed anybody to come to my house or speak to somebody that I don't know. And now anybody, good or bad, can enter the bedroom of every one of our children through these technologies. So um, the concern here is what is the world going to do about what is called moral responsibility? Because it seems like those who are good and pious, no matter what religion they are, they're absolutely afraid from using the internet. And that's really sad because there is a discrimination against this group just because they want to safeguard the, the way they raise their children, um, they have to deal with a lot of problems and maybe not even have internet access. So what is the world community going to do about that? And that's my question. So uh, I'm going to have to defer this question to a, to a different panel because I think that this is not the... I can answer it. Please. Okay, sure. 100 years ago, the same question was being asked about having phones in the homes and we won't talk to each other anymore face to face. We're here.
Yeah. It will adapt, it will evolve. I also think that there are lots of tools for individuals to make their own personal decisions about the way that they want to uh, give access to their kids or, or their own privacy or, or moral values. Uh, but if, if we have more questions, we'd love to focus on the enterprise side of things. Uh, people have any questions on that side of things? Yeah, hi. Uh, Daniel Ranimi from CEO Lebanon. Hi, yeah. Hi, Sister. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, my question is really focused on the on the enterprise thing. Uh, it goes to the 2020 for Ericsson and the 50 billion uh, connected devices. And uh, related to the uh, turning point that Carlota Perez talked about in your um, 2020, um, you know, like... Um, conference, and it goes to, uh, to Qualcomm also. Um, we're talking about a platform that cost billions and uh, sold in tens of millions or hundreds of millions that generates thousands of billions to people that doesn't belong to Qualcomm or Ericsson. What are you doing for that, for the future, I mean? Um, there's a new strategy of having uh, something like that. You, you build a platform, you sell it to an operator, the operator is not even investing enough in it, like Ziad was saying. In the future, you know, people using the internet for the mobile operator, and at the end of the day, they're not using the, uh, you know, the, all the consumption that is uh, host. And what will ever happen in the future? Qualcomm, Ericsson, what is the turning point of investing more and getting more out of your platforms rather than selling goods? sort of the investment in network infrastructure. I mean, Ericsson enables the network society and the 50 billion connection. We build the, the platforms and the networks, which on top of the operators um, put their services and so forth. And I think more and more we're going into the operators need, needing to articulate their value and maybe sharing some of the cost of the assets that they are investing in with some of the service provider like Google and Facebook and so forth because they're really generating a lot of revenue on someone else's investment. So then how can you sort of turn that power game around to, to either sort of change the, the way that traffic by throttling or, or, but I think you need to work on a different business model because someone is investing a lot in the assets but not really getting the return. So at the end, I mean that from economic terms that needs to be solved um, in the future. Really, when you think about it, Qualcomm chipsets, why are you here? That's the question I get every other day. And, and at the end of the, what we do, we have you know, 15, 20,000 very bright people working in our R&D and product partners and churning out technology every year. We invest around $3 billion just in R&D. And we're getting technologies now. These technologies, we don't send directly to the end user. We don't uh, buy a Qualcomm product as an end user, nor other, as a business most of the time. This is packaged then by our partners, sometimes the telcos, infrastructure vendors, app developers, <coughs> communities, uh, mostly mobile phone manufacturers, device manufacturers, tablets, etc. They take these technologies, they package it, and then they provide it as a service or a product to the end user. Why are we here today in, in Beirut, in the Middle East, in Africa? Uh, what we have a, a unique you know, way of doing things is that we are here to create a little bit of pull for these end user products and services that our partners are delivering. We believe that if we can help our partners sell more, uh, provide more relevant solutions, if we can have the consumer use more our, our technologies through our partners, at the end of the day, this is a win-win for everybody else. And being here, we, tend to, we try to bring a little bit of what we see in the market in terms of feedback to our headquarters by saying, look, the market needs Arabic support, or the market does not want this and wants that instead. So this is how we're trying to, to tackle this problem. And okay. remember in the, in the Wild West Gold Rush, the people that made most of the money were the ones selling the shovels and the, and the carriages, not the ones who found the gold. So the infrastructure, they sometimes complain, but it, it will remain, always remain a profitable business because it's the utility business. Predictable, nice cash flow, and profitable. I'll, I'll make a quick comment on this, and I think it's important for people who are interested in this discussion. Tomorrow there'll be a, a number of telecom CEOs discussing uh, the role of the, the operator in this space. Uh, but I actually, uh, what I would say is that these guys are doing the R&D, right? So they're gonna continue to be profitable because they're constantly innovating. Uh, and for me, the real question is, as the operator's role goes away from the infrastructure uh, and becomes more and more about just and buying infrastructure, setting it up, and, and packaging marketing, then what is the role of the operator? 
And I think that Sebastian is here because STC has realized that it needs to, to remain relevant, uh, create a company that will focus on applications, focus on content, focus on services. Um, but this is going to be a very interesting discussion tomorrow with some of the CEOs of these telecom operators. I think I mean, the, where the real opportunity is for operator is toward uh, ecosystem, enabling an ecosystem, you know, on, on, on bringing, uh, you know, APIs, bringing access enablers, you know, that will uh, build, enable, you know, any companies to do something and to do it in a very uh, scalable way. And I, I think, you know, the, this is where, you know, the opportunity is for operators, you know, you know to become smart pipes to really, because they have a lot to monetize, you know, they, they have a lot of uh, API, a lot of capabilities that could add a lot of value in many business, you know, on, uh, in the enterprise, you know, uh, in across multiple industries. And this is, I think, what is key, you know, for operators is to to make sure that this ecosystem, you know, uh, is uh, is profitable, you know, uh, give opportunities, and also is has clear rules, you know, where uh, we don't want this ecosystem to go in too many directions. We just want this to add value, you know, for 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 the people. So uh, I, I think this is where you know the, the biggest opportunity is for for operators and. Back to the to the challenges, you know, with very large OTT players. Uh, this is, you know, this is also something uh, clear. Is uh, yeah, I mean, there are some very large global, uh, uh, you know, on, on uh, multinational players that are really riding, you know, on the the, the very big uh, capex and opex investment of uh, of operators, and that's something that. Uh, as an industry, you know, is tackled by most of the largest operators. Let's just be, give one concrete example before we wrap this up, right? And I, what comes to mind is Mobile Baby, because this is very relevant to what we're talking about today, and relevant to how an operator working with an industry to create a content or service that can be monetizable. And this is something that applies to a lot of people in the room who are interested in working with telecom operators or interested in working with industries or with the applications. Can you guys tell us about Mobile Baby? Okay, uh, so. Uh, this is a, you know, a, simple a, a very nice uh, solution that uh, a Swedish company that Ericsson came up with called Great Connection. We've uh, helped them, you know, roll it out in the region, uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, and now in, in other countries in Africa. It's a very simple solution when a, uh, a pregnant mother to be goes to the hospital for uh, uh, ultrasound of her baby. Uh, today you get a printout of, of the ultrasound picture and you go show it to your father and to, to the father and etc. And uh, that solution just enables the, the ultrasound machine to send the picture directly by email or by MMS, MMS yes, to the end user's uh, mobile phone or uh, very simple solution. Now, this is from a lifestyle perspective. Of course, there are applications for it that could be from a more remote monitoring perspective when the doctor is not even uh, in, uh, in the field and there's a midwife that is uh, doing that service and can send the picture. Another very nice service that Etisalat has rolled out in Tanzania now and this together with Mobile Baby, they were uh, they received uh, an award uh, for in, uh, in Barcelona last month at the Mobile World Congress, is, uh, is basically a solution that really helps uh, save lives uh, on the ground and bring lives. Uh, Tanzania and other African countries, uh, you know, have infrastructure challenges and uh, what it's Salat is doing is providing uh, all these midwives out in, in the villages and the rural areas with uh, low end, very cheap Android smartphones have a special app running uh, uh, on top of them, which is a lot of their partners bid. And whenever uh, a woman is close to delivery, uh, basically the midwife with, with a few clicks on the apps just puts in motion the whole chain of events that need to happen to, have, to ensure a safe delivery. From calling an ambulance, or if an ambulance is not available, a taxi, to transferring money to the taxi driver by mobile credit, to alerting the hospital that somebody is coming in, getting the insurance, uh, ready for that, etc., etc., etc. Now, it was a small pilot today in Tanzania. Just last month, 190 small babies were born using this application. So they are really the first generation of mobile babies around the world. And now we hope that Salat will roll this, uh, you know, around most of their footprint, and maybe even uh, this will pick up to become a service across all emerging and developing markets. Can I just go back to the question regarding the operators as well? I think now many of these over-the-top players has been sort of more consumer-oriented, like Facebook, yeah, Twitter, and so forth. When we move into the enterprise space, the enterprise has more concerns about security, privacy, it needs to have telecom grade quality, and so forth. So I think in that space, the telecom operators have more of a natural role to play because they're more a trusted partner. So you would rather have them manage some of your applications and your services. So it might be that the over-the-top are more and towards the, the, the consumers, and the operator will play a larger role in the enterprise verticals. 
Okay. Uh, I think I want to wrap up this session. Uh, you want to ask the last question? Yeah. Do we have time for another question? Okay, great. Quick question here. Take one last question. Yeah. I would like to ask you why you have selected these four tracks in the industry day, which is travel, healthcare, banking, education. Does it mean that all the money goes here? And this question is important for people who are yet to start the business. So we need to understand what are the most industries that attract uh, customers. So uh, we understand from here that travel education, healthcare, and, and banking maybe are the most um, attractive. Is it true? And if not, then what are the most other industries that we really do need to get focus on? Thank you. I guess it's a question for me. Finally. Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the first part of the question, then I'll let the panel tell us what other industries might be interesting for you guys to look at. Um, I think that the reason why we selected these industries is because we have been seeing a lot of applications coming out in these spaces, a lot of investments in companies that are working in this space, a lot of startups emerging in these spaces. Uh, I mean, I can mention like uh, Kitabi, uh, Ekratli, um, uh, Hood Hood, all working in the space of edutainment. Uh, there's uh, uh, Irwa, there's, who's here with us today, there's uh, Ikshif, there's a number of medical uh, uh, startups that are coming out. So from our vantage point, as uh, people who are really interested in what's going on in the startup space, uh, we're seeing hot uh, companies working in these sectors. Uh, we are also seeing the operators getting interested in these sectors. And these are also some of the biggest sectors around. So uh, they're a natural fit. Travel and tourism actually is one that uh, has been for a long time quite advanced in, uh, in digital technology. Uh, but it's, uh, it's experiencing a huge boom here in the region. We've seen the emergence of a number of online travel agents, a uh, number of which have come from traditional uh, traditional travel agents, right? So we've got Travel Sheikh and Hujuzat who are both coming from traditional travel agents now launching online presence. Uh, so this is kind of how we curated the, the day today. We've got conversation about everything from like telemedicine to uh, remote learning to uh, uh, learning management systems, uh, health information systems, electronic medical records, uh, online travel agents, um, uh, mobile payments, mobile banking, so these are the things that you can look forward to in the second half of the day. But uh, if the audience has any specific industries that they think are of spe special relevance, that would be great. Entertainment. Entertainment. Music and entertainment. And uh, does it read on the uh, Saudis preferring the Arabic uh, uh, language? It was a specific question for app users. Which language do they prefer for their applications on their smartphones? And uh, more people said Arabic than, uh, than English. So that's, that's the question for the tweet. I love this interactivity. <laughs> so the, uh, for entertainment, in actually, we will cover a lot of the entertainment stuff in the forum. So the, this is the reason why we selected kind of these more traditional industries for today. Uh, and tomorrow and the next day, we'll discuss everything from television to gaming, uh, to content, to advertising, social media, and everything else. So uh, I think this afternoon, we will talk a little bit more uh, on mobile health in one of the panels. If you're around, there's a very nice, uh, talk in the tourism panel, I think Hala Zawati from Easy Info Jordan will talk about a nice way that mobile can really enhance the travel and tourism industry with using augmented reality. But talking about what else can be, you know, and if we, we had a one month Arab net next year, what are the tracks that we would uh, go into? You know, mobile entertainment, of course, and really who pays the bill at the end of the day, because mobile entertainment will consume a lot of bandwidth, so it's what we call sponsored connectivity and sponsored services. And uh, my favorite, uh, of course, uh, not to Fauzi and Alex in the back, mobile advertising. Come on, guys. Banners, SMSs, <laughs> give us something. You know? right, Please, one full day about that next year. Yeah? So this is something that, that I know Qualcomm uh, is very interested in, the concept that if we watch television, we watch it for free. And we watch television for free because there are ads. A lot of television, not all television. But, you know, uh, why are we consume internet, we pay for it. Why not have ads on our you know, provided by our internet service provider that subsidize actually our access, right? So ad subsidized access is something that we can see maybe in the future. But, I mean, I, both e-health and mobile money, it's such a big industry in terms of market size. I think it's, they're estimating 60, 600 billion US dollars worth of mobile money payments. So it's probably an obvious choice when you want to choose those. But then there's all these things that start with E, if it's E, um, transportation or smart grids and e-government or everything that make can sort of make the society efficient 
But I guess <laughs> there's always a choice. You need to focus in order to be able to drill down and actually make the conversations interesting. Well, excellent. Thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, we'll have a coffee break. We'll be back for a couple of talks and a session that's more focused on uh, social media, listening, and uh, client relationship management. We're kind of the more uh, marketing people here. Uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing you after the break. Thank you. Thank you.